Good afternoon. Um, it, it is a distinct honor and a personal privilege uh, to be able to moderate this panel uh, titled Reflections on the Hague Conference at 140, uh, 20 years forward, so uh, 20 years from today's 120th anniversary. Uh, in particular, we will focus on the work of the conference relating to the three pillars of its activities, family law, legal cooperation, and commercial law. As you can see from our program, we have an outstanding panel of senior officials from other international organizations to address this subject. Uh, they will speak in a little different order from what you have in your program. My role is to keep matters moving smoothly and to incite our panelists to, pro to a productive discussion among themselves after their initial remarks. I also promise that we'll try to reserve some time for questions from the audience to our distinguished panelists. To allow that schedule, our panelists have each pledged to speak initially for 10 minutes maximum, and they've asked me to be strict about it. When they've all spoken, they'll raise questions among themselves and have an exchange of thoughts about the ideas they have presented. Uh, we'll then turn to the audience. Our goal is to identify during this panel specific proposals for collaboration by the conference with the organizations represented here today. Given our limited time together, each of our panelists has graciously agreed that I should offer only short biographical information with emphasis on present responsibilities and prior experience that bears on the subject matter today. It would take all of our time to recount the educational training and accomplishments of this panel. For your cooperation, panelists, uh, I'm most grateful. Before the first introduction, if you'll permit me a very short story that I hope will inspire us today. Two years after his graduation in mathematics from King's College, Cambridge, Alan Turing, then 26 years old, published an article in 1936 in the Proceedings of the London Mathematical Society. That article described generally what has come to be called the Turing machine, not an actual construct, but if you will, a virtual machine. And the article explained the efficiencies of such a machine. Mathematic, mathematicians will argue about whether Turing covered everything or got it all right, but this much we can say with the benefit of hindsight. In the one publication by this young man, there was described many of the key elements of today's digital age. The overall design and operation of computers, the uses of software programs, and the development of algorithms. 77 years later after that article, it holds up rather well as an astonishing look into the future. I don't know whether we'll do as well as Alan Turing did in his time in describing the future of private international law today or the role of the Hague Conference. We'll certainly try to peer at least 20 years into the future and to predict, even advocate, specific collaborative programs with the Hague Conference by each of the organizations represented here. And now our first speaker, Ms. Suzanne Bissell. Ms. Bissell is Chief of Child Protection at the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, a position she's held since 2009. Ms. Bissell's current appointment is the culmination of decades of successful completion of many challenging assignments to protect the rights and well-being of children. Today, with programs in 170 countries, her office directs a team of professionals dedicated to, among other matters, assisting children affected by armed conflict and strengthening systems designed to prevent violence against children. Ms. Bissell, thank you for being here today, and I'd like to invite you to the podium.
Thank you, Peter. Good afternoon, everyone. Excellencies, Mr. Secretary General, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, I'm delighted and honored to be back in the Netherlands, and thank you for inviting UNICEF to be part of this panel today, celebrating 120 years of the Hague Conference on International Private Law. My colleagues in New York have asked me to say many happy returns. Both you, the Hague Conference, and we, UNICEF, have among our aspirations that of protecting children throughout the world. And while we cannot protect them from everything, we can and must protect them from violence, exploitation, and abuse. Who are the children we're protecting? They are the 220 million under the age of five who live in the developing world right now who do not have birth certificates. They are the 150 million children in the world who are engaged in the worst forms of child labor. The one billion children living in countries and territories affected by war. The thousands of children who languish in institutions the world over. And they are also the children living in the 14 countries that are listed by the Security Council for committing grave violations against children such as recruitment, killing, and maiming. These high numbers are numbers that we would like to see reach zero, perhaps during the next 40 year, or 20 years of our collaboration with the Hague Conference. There's an underlying moral rationale for this, a rights imperative, and a sound economic argument. While protecting children is already a big task when children live in homes and communities, it is an even bigger, and I would argue growing, challenge when children are on the move. Today we see children who move with both parents, with one parent, mobile on their own at any age, I hasten to add, alongside a friend or in the hands of a trafficker. Children and families are mobile in response to climate change or conflict, to unite with extended family members, or simply to seek a better life. Mobility in whatever guise can make children particularly vulnerable. And with the increasing numbers of children crossing national state boundaries, protection concerns are becoming increasingly cross-border and require inter-country collaboration. And this is certainly a trend that we envisage well into the future. Although we have different missions and mandates, both UNICEF and the Hague Conference face similar challenges and opportunities in using international law to protect children and to support families. We both must grapple with the difficulties involved in applying international legal standards and instruments to a diverse range of national legal systems. Both of our organizations consider not only the focus on the legislation in the country, but also on the application of that legislation. And both organizations persevere in these endeavors despite the many challenges that we face because we understand the importance of international law not just at the statutory level, but in everyday lives of people, of families. We understand the four Hague Children's Conventions, as well as the Convention on the Rights of the Child, as binding legal documents to which we can hold governments accountable for their obligations to children and families, and that at the most basic level, as fundamental building blocks of a system of laws and standards to protect and support children, especially at times in their lives when they may be especially vulnerable. And it's this intersection of public and private law that we see playing out no more visibly in UNICEF's mandate than in the protection of children. UNICEF recognizes that the importance of the four Hague Conventions in bridging gaps between public and private international law lies not just in ensuring that states regulate issues such as intercountry adoption and maintenance or respond to international abduction and to trafficking in a harmonized and systematized manner. The Hague Conventions also matter because their implementation at state level directly affects implementation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. This commitment to protecting every child is our greatest common bond, and it is a common bond that I sincerely hope we will still be celebrating when UNICEF reaches its 120th anniversary. Both UNICEF and the Hague Conference know that ratification of a convention and the depositing of official documents do not signal the end of our work. 
as great as that may be to arrive at that point. UNICEF and the Hague Conference have enjoyed a particularly fruitful collaboration, co-parenting, as it were, the Convention's first steps in a country, with UNICEF supporting their oper operationalization in individual countries and collaborating with the Hague Conference in addressing particular issues. For example, in many countries, UNICEF has taken a role in facilitating missions by the Permanent Bureau to provide technical assistance, invaluable technical assistance, I hasten to add, in implementing the Convention requirements. And UNICEF works with the government to ensure the policy and legal integration within the whole child protection system, such as in building the capacity of child protection services. Two recent missions I just did, one in Cambodia, there, for instance, we have supported six permanent bureau missions, including one by the Secretary General himself. And in Guatemala, there have been nine missions of the permanent bureau to strengthen that country's adoption system. And of course, we still have much more work to do in Guatemala. We've also worked together on multi-country events, such as regional meetings in Latin America and Southern Africa. This cooperation both allows for awareness raising and identification of training or technical assistance needs in countries yet to contract to the convention. For example, a, a workshop for Southern and Eastern Africa on all of the child-related hate conventions in February 2010 has influenced the decisions of two Southern African countries to take steps to join the inter-country adoption convention, namely Angola and Botswana. Other events supported by UNICEF included the third Malta conference in March 2009 and training for judges in Madagascar in 2010. A representative of the Hague Permanent Bureau also participated in the Francophone conference on the alternative care guidelines in Senegal in May 2012 and in the Child Protection Systems Conference in New Delhi in November of 2012. Ladies and gentlemen, UNICEF would again like to congratulate the conference on reaching its 120th anniversary. Thank you again for our fruitful collaboration, which we anticipate well into the next 20 years. There's still much to be done at a time when children are increasingly mobile and always precious. It is certainly fair to say that the more countries that contract to the Hague Conventions, the better protected children will be. UNICEF stands ready to collaborate with the Hague Conference in every way possible. As we envisage our future work together, we certainly anticipate paying greater attention to the 1996 Child Protection Convention and its implementation. This will imp imply capacity building within our own organization and we'll reach out to you for your expertise and experience in this process. And to conclude, if I may, on a personal note, thanks to you, Hans, and to your team, for the warm and collegial relationships we maintain. We look forward to sustaining these, in particular with you as well, Hans, wherever your path takes you next. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Benjamin uh, Mesmer. Mr. Mesmer is a member of the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child. He's a research fellow and lecturer at the University of Western Cape in Cape Town, South Africa, and he has been the vice chairperson of the African Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of the Child with special responsibility for addressing concerns with violence against children. Mr. Mesmer, thank you very much, and I give you the podium. I usually say I'm vertically challenged, so I have to lift. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. It's a pleasure to be here, to be back here in The Hague, but also in this hall. Uh, good afternoon, honorable guests, excellencies, friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I am the youngest, but probably have the longest uh, indications of my associations in terms of organizations. Uh, I will speak in my personal capacity, but also as a member, but uh, I want to say at the outset that whatever I say now does not necessarily represent uh, the views of the organizations that uh, I belong to. First of all, congratulations are in order. Turning 120 is not an easy feat. I would like to thank the organizers for the, the kind invitation and positive gesture that I have received from their end. 
indeed in a fashion unmistakable in both clarity and intent, this reaffirms the fact that one of the organization's priorities remains children's rights. It's also, it also underscores the point that the Hague Conference is indeed a global and multifaceted organization with an ever-increasing interest and impact on the African continent. I only have 10 minutes, so I'll limit my intervention in terms of geography, target group, uh, and also treaty. Namely, I'll try to focus as much as possible on Africa, on children. And while I would have liked to talk about the four Hague Children's Conventions, my intervention will predominantly be about the Intercountry Adoption Convention and maybe a word or two English to the 1996 Child Protection Convention. But before I come to my main points, I want to make a few preliminary remarks. Africa is increasingly looking inwards to find solutions to its challenges based on African institutions. This is one of the main reasons why collaboration with African institutions for the Hague Conference is inevitable. Secondly, African countries are increasingly trying to learn from each other's countries and regions' experiences, which again makes cooperation with African institutions important. In this respect, the concept of comparability is important. If you want to give an example to an African country, you're better off if you give an example based on experience from another African country, as opposed to trying to draw experiences from other countries in the world. And Africa is not only becoming the new frontier in relation to intercountry adoption. Africa is also increasingly becoming concerned and involved in relation to issues that are covered by the other three Hague Children's Conventions. The Hague Conference, and unfortunately, the number of African countries that are members of the Hague Conference is very limited. The Hague Conference is aware of some of the obvious reasons why this is the case, and maybe through some sort of cooperation and international support, an aggressive effort can be made to increase, to increase such representation. On a related note, the number of states parties to the Hague Children's Convention is increasing with time, and that is very positive. For instance, the last three countries out of five countries that have ratified the Hague Convention on Intercountry Adoption are African countries, namely Rwanda, Lesotho, and Swaziland. While I'm on the topic of ratification, the CRC Committee as a treaty body has consistently and systematically recommended to state parties to the CRC to ratify the Hague Convention. It has done this since early 1994, before the Hague Convention on Intercountry Adoption came into force. In fact, in its recommendations, the CRC Committee's language has partly shifted with time, emphasizing the increasing importance of ratifying the Hague Convention. This shift in emphasis is notable starting from a statement that says, the committee hopes the state party will become a part, the state will become a state party, to the state party ratify, to the committee recommends that the state party speedily ratify, to the last one, which is one of my favorites, which says the committee notes with regret that the state party has still not ratified the Hague Intercountry Adoption Convention. A similar level of Lobbying and collaboration is needed not only to sustain this push in relation to the Hague Convention on Intercountry Adoption by the CRC Committee, but also by the African Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of the Child that supervises the implementation of the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child. But also, not only in the context of the Hague Intercountry Adoption, but also in relation to the other three Hague Children's Conventions. One of the issues that cooperation helps to minimize is inconsistency. Inconsistency on conceptualization, inconsistency in implementation, and inconsistency in follow-ups. Much clarity is needed in relation to some principles and concepts in the context of intercountry adoption. Therefore, the Hague Conference can strongly cooperate with treaty bodies in proposing and giving concrete input for a general comment on Article 21 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. I would like to go one step further and say this. In fact, the idea of a general comment on Article 21 of the CRC is not so much an idea whose time has come as an idea whose time is few years late in coming. In addition, 
a treaty body is often as strong as its information base. Issues related to the Hague Children's Conventions are not necessarily getting the attention they deserve in the consideration of state party reports by treaty bodies. In this respect, a leaf can be taken from the global initiative to end corporal punishment that regularly submits briefs to the relevant human rights treaty bodies prior to the consideration of a state party report. This has significantly helped in raising the information base of these treaty bodies and contributed to adding clarity to the nature of state party obligations and other stakeholders in relation to the subject matter. It was already alluded this afternoon that the success of the Hague Conference cannot only be measured on the basis of member states and the ratification of Hague Conventions, but to a certain extent, on the basis of the extent to which these instruments actually influence domestic legislation. I have a very peculiar example, which is Malawi. In 2005, Malawi had the children's bill that was being drafted, and it had a very interesting provision. That provision said, the government of Malawi will not undertake inter-country adoption with countries that are not state parties to the Hague Convention on Inter-Country Adoption. The interesting part about this provision was the fact that Malawi itself was not and is still not a member of the Hague Convention on Inter-Country Adoption. I can say more words on judicial training, which the Permanent Bureau has done in few occasions, which still has a significant contribution in promoting the Hague Children's Conventions. In the area of inter-country adoption, a number of case laws on the African continent bring to the fore the role of international players, notably the Permanent Bureau, Central Authorities, Foreign Adoption Agencies, Treaty Bodies, and the international media. This is because in the absence of a uniform approach and because legislation in a number of African countries has not been finalized, judge-made law in this region is resulting in inconsistencies and sometimes incoherence in the interpretation and application of the principles and rules governing inter-country adoption. Until such time that the executive branch of government take the lead in this process, the urgent need for regular and concrete judicial training by the Hague Conference for a number of African countries continues to be. Regional seminars and workshops continue to play a significant role to promote the work of the Hague Conference, but also to collectively provide training and support to states likely to share many of the same concerns or obstacles. These events also help to profile the advantages of the Hague Convention, offer a platform for networking and dialogue, and assist in identifying regional and sub-regional challenges and opportunities to improve the cross-border protection of children. Such events can also be seen as capacity building exercises contributing to the expertise of stakeholders, such as judges, lawyers, on the implementation of the Hague Convention. It also helps to be a stock-taking exercise to identify law reform efforts that are currently existing in draft form in order to embed the principles and underlying tenets of the Hague Conventions that will help to promote children's rights. At this juncture, a word or two is in order in relation to the 1996 Hague Convention. The challenge in relation to the 93 Convention in a number of African countries is predominantly misconception. For instance, countries feel that if they ratify the Hague Convention, it means flood, opening the floodgates. Or some countries believe that if they ratify the Hague Convention, they might be forced to allow homosexual adoptions. Now that's in relation to the 1993 Hague Convention. But when you come to the 1996 Hague Convention, it is purely lack of awareness of the existence of this very document. And the, 19, the 2010 World Cup has actually brought to light quite a number of, I'm just mentioning one single example, has brought to light the number of advantages that the 1996 convention can bring to the fore. This is again a need to cooperate. There is again a need to cooperate with various institutions, including the treaty bodies, but also the regional economic communities at the Africa level, such as the Economic Community of West African States, the Southern Africa Development Community. I want to spend one minute, perhaps, in relation to inter talking about inter inter international surrogacy. I foresee the need for a more concrete and strong cooperation with various institutions, including the treaty bodies and regional organizations. The issues revolving around international surrogacy are complex and becoming more pressing. Coming up with an agreeable and solid international instrument on international surrogacy will, will by no means be a walk in the park, and I'm not original in saying this. Rather, it is probably going to be a situation of what I refer to 10% inspiration 90% perspiration work. The so-called prescriptive and restrictive approaches 
a liberal and non-interventionist regime strongly promoted by few but influential countries, issues of international consensus, committee, and so forth will require cooperation and collaboration at the highest level, including from the treaty bodies. And the treaty bodies will have to play a role not only in promoting the ratification of an ultimate document that hopefully will be adopted, but also in the conceptualization and the drafting of such specific documents. Three more points before I conclude. Maybe 20 years down the line, it might not only be possible but desirable too to establish a practice and system of inter-country adoption that works not on the basis of receiving countries that approach sending countries, but rather a reverse of this model which emphasizes the need of countries of origin and protects them from undue pressure from receiving countries, a system which is practically based on a child-centered approach, more or less a system that I call a don't call me, I will call you system. In addition, with the optional protocol on individual complaints of the Committee on the Rights of the Child coming into force in the foreseeable future, it also opens another avenue for input from the Hague Conference in the work of the CRC Committee. I also note with great interest and appreciation the recent opening of the new Hague Conference Asia-Pacific Regional Office in Hong Kong. Some of the proposals that I just mentioned would indeed be facilitated well with the presence of a similar regional office in Africa. To wrap up, the Hague Conference is already undertaking most of these issues mentioned above, though there is room for deepening and widening the efforts. Most of these issues need additional resources. They need to be, there, there is a need to be proactive as opposed to being reactive. I don't believe in the saying that the lack of money is the root of all evils. It's my submission that this would be resources well utilized to cover the part of the world with more than 50% of its population below the age of 18. That has a number of challenges, but also opportunities for the application of the Hague Children's Conventions. <coughs> Excuse me. In this respect, the treaty bodies can and should play a significant role and cooperate with the Hague Conference in bringing this to, to fruition. Maybe on a lighter note, in 20 years when the Hague Conference celebrates its 140th anniversary, I'm sure I'm not being too optimist to expect than to hope that we will have one excellency speaking on the impact of the Hague Conference in the Africa region. And I hope to be active and around when that happens. Congratulations in turning 120, but clearly this is not an organization that is counting its days, but making its days count. It is not growing old, but growing up. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Mesmer, thank you very much. Uh, our, our third speaker is Jose Angelo Estrella Faria. Uh, Mr. Estrella Faria has served since October 2008 as the Secretary General of the International Institute for the Unification of Private Law, UNIDWA. Uh, many in this room know Mr. Estrella Faria from his years of effective service as a senior legal officer with the Secretariat of UNCTRAL, the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law in Vienna. He also served for a number of years with the General Legal Division of the UN Office of Legal Affairs in New York. Uh, Mr. Estrella Faria has kindly agreed to reflect on the conference's potential collaboration with both UNIDWA and Ancetral. Thank you very much for taking on the dual role. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Excellencies, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to participate at this high-level panel as we celebrate the 120th anniversary of the Hague Conference on Private International Law. UNIDRA and the Hague Conference have similar mandates, namely to harmonize and unify the law into distinct but complementary areas private international law, the Hague Conference, and substantive private law, UNIDRA. We share a long history of close cooperation, UNIDRA being second only to the Hague Conference in age among the existing international organizations, which I would not be able to review in the limited time available to this panel. As a matter of fact, this is not what I have been asked to do today. It is befitting of the Hague Conference dynamic and visionary Secretary General, my dear friend, Hans van Loon, that we celebrate the conference jubilee not by taking stock of the conference's remarkable record of achievements 
in its long history, but by looking ahead at its development in the next 20 years. We're all eager to jump back into the future, so I shall be brief. Here's what the crystal ball of a sister organization of the Hague Conference shows me. Raising awareness of legal harmonization work. At least in the commercial law field, and this is the uh, center of attention for the work of UNIDRA. Legal harmonization work is justified by the belief that legal disparity is an obstacle to trade and investment, and that legal harmonization helps reduce transaction costs. However, the impact of uniform law is not easily quantifiable which makes it difficult to secure an adequate level of political interest for legal harmonization work. I would hope that by the year 2023, formulating agencies have used their extensive contact to industry, practitioners, and the academic world to develop a methodology for systematically assessing the economic impact of legal harmonization. The availability of general economic impact studies may be instrumental in removing preconceived ideas that dismissed the harmonization process as if it were a purely academic leisure exercise. This would also help to gain domestic support for specific uniform law projects and expediting practical implementation. A second hope in this context would be that governments and international organizations develop greater awareness of the private law implications of broader topics in the international political agenda environment, migration, trade liberalization, food security, child protection, money laundering, you name it. Admittedly, private law is not at the forefront of the debate on any of these issues, and understandably so. But all these phenomena also have private law implications. Greater investment in food production requires a favorable legal framework. International trade demands respect of contracts, child protection, the enforcement of judgments, Fighting money laundering presupposes transparent corporate structures. The protection of the environment imposes liability for environmental damage. Rule of law begins with constitutional law, political, social, and human rights, but is not complete without individual private rights. Second point, international harmonization and domestic law reform. The classical reading of the mandate given to formulating agencies would limit their activities to harmonizing private law at the international level, rather than helping states modernize their domestic private law. A more constructive and forward-looking interpretation, however, would enable formulating agencies where appropriate to promote the modernization of the law of particular groups of states in need of special assistance. In the same way that awareness of economic impact may strengthen the case for legal unification and harmonization, the consistent integration of economic analysis in the harmonization process where appropriate enhances the role of formulated agencies in promoting domestic law reform. International uniform law instruments elaborated with the expertise and under the auspices of UNIDRA, the Hague Conference, and UNCITRA reflect legal standards acceptable to various legal systems and countries at different stages of economic development. They deserve being recognized as solid, unbiased, and transparent indicators of the quality of the law in the areas they cover. I would dare to hope that by the year 2033, bilateral and multilateral donors providing assistance to domestic law reform will have duly acknowledged the advantages in terms of greater legitimacy and acceptability of such instruments as opposed to legislation drafted ad hoc by private sector consultants. Of course, formulating agencies would seldom have expertise in all areas related to the practical implementation of their text, continues available for addressing all needs of receiving countries. However, this should not in itself be an obstacle to more involvement in law reform. The formulation of joint programs or implementation strategies in cooperation with other organizations involved in the rulemaking or law reform in a given area might allow for the development of a common approach to the implementation of specific standards or instruments, obviously suitably adapted to the context. The input of formulating agencies might be limited to general advice on the elements of such an approach, or might, subject to availability of resources, which are uh, chronically low in our area, extend to greater involvement in specific projects. At the very least, the secretariat of a formulating agency has a role to play as a clearinghouse 
of information to know who the specialists are in particular fields of the law. This brings me to my last point, and that is cooperation in implementation and application of international standards. An international law instrument is of little value if it is not implemented in practice and if it's not correctly applied. Deficient domestic institutional design, poor regulatory machinery, insufficient resources and lack of training, among others, are known for frustrating the objectives of law reform. In other areas, uniform law instruments may be incorrectly applied or it may even be avoided due to lack of knowledge by judges and practitioners. The Hague Conference has been a pioneer among the rulemaking organization in devising tools for proper implementation of Hague instruments. It suffices to mention the framework for cooperation and sharing of information in connection with the child adoption and the child abduction conventions. The focus on the implementation phase should be intensified in the future and should eventually become a regular feature of each international uniform law instrument whenever possible. UNIDRA itself has experience with the establishment of an operational infrastructure to ensure the practical functioning of an international convention, namely the International Registry for Aircraft Objects under the Cape Town Convention on International Interest in Mobile Equipment. Based in Dublin and managed by a private company selected through international public bidding, the registry works under the supervision of the International Civil Aviation ICAO. The registry operates exclusively by electronic means, applying the highest standards of data protection and speed of communications, and already counts about 300,000 filings since the entry into force of the convention in 2006. I would hope that by the year 2023, Formula 80 agencies and the organizations that are affected by the work we do have expanded existing mechanisms for dissemination, disseminating information on the application of uniform texts, beyond the various databases and information tools that already exist into a systematic and as much as possible coordinated approach to the application of uniform law instruments. As a matter of fact, drawing on its expertise in the era of judicial cooperation, the Hague Conference could become the leading agency in identifying needs for assistance in connection with the application of uniform law instruments and devising assistance programs beyond the implementation of its own instruments. Additional measures to, propose, to promote uniform interpretation might include uh, increased support for programs for training judges in the interpretation and application of uniform law. This might take the form of seminars or even a common syllabus or other forms of teaching materials that might be used for training purposes or be incorporated in the curricula of domestic academies or schools dedicated to the training or continuing education of judges. Allow me just to open a parenthesis. One of the most successful conventions in the area of private law is the United Nations Convention on Contest for an International Sale of Goods. Now, one would be surprised to see that more often than not, the convention is avoided rather than applied because parties are simply not aware of the convention. They haven't spent the time, and very often in law school, they have not heard a word about the convention, even countries that have ratified the convention for more than 10, 20 years now. Uh, if you consider that the in international community invests an average of not less than $10 million in developing one international convention, it is a remarkable waste of taxpayers' money if these conventions are later on not applied because they're not taught in law school. Now, cooperation with universities and in particular with other international organizations with expertise in technical assistance and training for lawyers from developing countries should be explored with a view to developing joint programs of the all organizations involved in private law rulemaking, conceivably standard teaching materials or a teaching plan for uniform law. Ladies and gentlemen, I have exhausted my time, but certainly not the list of what this great organization can still be doing 20 years down the road and even less so of what the foresight of its Secretary General could have envisaged by then, were he not about to embark in another exciting phase of his life for which I should like to take this opportunity to wish him the best of luck and happiness. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Rufus, Rufus Yerksa. Mr. Yerksa is the deputy uh, uh, Deputy Director General of the World Trade Organization, uh, a post to which he was named in 2002. 
uh, prior to his service at the WTO, Mr. Yerkeson was Deputy United States Trade Representative. In addition to serving in a senior position on the Ways and Means Committee of the U.S. House of Representatives, which of course has important responsibilities for trade law, uh, Mr. Yerkeson has practiced law both with a major international law firm, Aiken, Gump, Strauss, Hauser, and Feld, and as European and International Counsel uh, with Monsanto Company. Uh, Mr. Yorkshire, we're happy to have you with us, and I'll give you the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary General and uh, Peter, uh, organizers of this conference. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be here at your uh, 120th anniversary meeting, and uh, certainly to be uh, asked to be part of such a, a diverse panel of of international officials, international civil servants. Uh, you know, they, we all work in, in very different areas with very different institutional affiliations, uh, yet the one thing that, that brings us together, the one common element, is that obviously these are people who are convinced that international uh, cooperation, such as that fostered by regional and multilateral institutions, uh, and by these efforts at creating a better rule of law internationally uh, are an essential tool for addressing the main challenges facing the global community. In a world now where people and goods and services uh, as well as money crosses borders with such uh, rapidity and such ease, uh, the ability of nation states acting independently uh, to deal with the many problems that are the byproduct of this phenomenon of, of globalization uh, are becoming more and more apparent. The difficulties are becoming more and more apparent. So fostering international cooperation is, is, is essential, but it is certainly not an easy task. As a, a former resident of The Hague, uh, Baruch Spinoza, once said, all excellent things are as difficult as they are rare. And certainly it is uh, rare to find uh, complete su success in the areas we work in, but uh, the effort goes on. Um, now the Hague Conference and the WTO do not have a long history of working together. I hope this is the beginning of, of more cooperation and more interaction. Uh, we have very different mandates and work in different uh, ways, but in many ways uh, goals and objectives are the same. Uh, the Hague Conference, of course, is promoting the progressive development of common rules of private international law and serving as a forum for developing and implementing treaties and conventions in different fields of private international law, but these apply uh, certainly in a way to, to promote and facilitate uh, the contractual rights and the abilities of uh, private individuals to uh, work across borders. The WTO, uh, by contrast, uh, is a classic uh, public international law body, an intergovernmental agreement uh, with membership uh, only of governments. Uh, its purpose is to reduce obstacles to trade and promote a level playing field, a, a rule of law between states and to serve as a forum for governments to develop and implement rules in areas that include trade in goods, trade in services, intellectual property rights. Uh, and although our um, agreements do not impose obligations on individuals, they impose obligations on states. If you think about it, the activities of uh, both of our institutions are instrumental to the broader goal of promoting uh, trade and investment as a way of contributing to development and to economic growth. You have to ask the question, uh, what good it, would it be for governments to grant uh, rights to each other for freer commerce if private individuals could not uh, protect those rights in uh, their contractual or private um, relationships? So the interdependence between what we do in trying to create a, a broader framework of global rules for trade are certainly the interdependence with the many, many conventions which have been developed uh, through the participation of, of um, 
this organization of it and of institutions like uh, UNIDRA uh, is absolutely uh, clear. Now, just back on the WTO, uh, you know this is a system that's origins go back to 1947 to the original GATT agreement uh, and then changed to the WTO uh, in 1995 with many of the same agreements being carried forward. So for more than 60 years, it has been successful in reducing uh, many of the border obstacles to trade and in liberating uh, trade as a factor in promoting economic growth over the last half century and, and lifting literally millions of people out of poverty. But it's clear that there is much, much, much further to go and more to do in terms of creating a fairer international trading system, particularly focusing on, for example, improving the uh, rights of um, least developed and developing countries in the trading system, uh, and also in finding other areas not yet covered by our rules, uh, many of which would, I think, create new opportunities for you here in, uh, in the Hague uh, Conference because they definitely would create more transactions uh, across borders and therefore more need to protect private rights. Let me just give you one area uh, that is certainly something we've been working on recently, an example where uh, certainly the, the creation of a better rule of law in, um, in international transactions uh, would be a, a significant uh, contribution to uh, development and economic growth. And that is the recent work on uh, creating a WTO agreement on trade facilitation. Uh, this is a sort of a technical term, but trade facilitation uh, covers many of the areas related to the processing and clearance of goods across borders. The reduction of formalities and documentation requirements for importing, exporting, for transiting goods from landlocked countries to uh, countries with ports, uh, for the establishment of things like a single window for traders to submit documentation and data uh, to government officials in order to uh, carry out their trading transactions, the possibility of electronic submission uh, to uh, allow pre-clearance of goods and those kinds of things, the strengthening of cooperation between customs and border agencies of our member countries to eliminate consular transaction requirements in con connection with the importation of goods. One reliable estimate of uh, the costs of complying with these kinds of formalities and procedures and paperwork associated with border delays has uh, concluded that they constitute today roughly 10% of the value of any trade transaction. And if you take total world trade, this puts the cost of these kinds of transaction costs at about $2 trillion annually on a global basis, uh, which is equivalent to almost double the current average of the tariffs imposed by governments on trade and goods. So an agreement in this area with fewer uh, formalities, less paperwork, less red tape, would not only speed up transactions, but would also uh, enable consumers all over the world to benefit from the, uh, from the lower costs. Of course, this also means that uh, there, the framework of private uh, rights, the framework of conventions and agreements to ensure the uh, enforceability of contracts and the, um, the rule of law in private transactions becomes even more uh, important. I think this is one area, obviously, where we can begin to work together. My main message today, however, is since we are such very different organizations with such very different history, uh, the beginning of cooperation and uh, better communication between us, I think, uh, would be a, a, a very significant thing, and I'm certainly committed to helping to promote that in the future. I want to thank you for inviting me today, and I certainly uh, look forward to the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, including the research on Spinoza. Impressive. Uh, our final speaker is Ms. Anne-Marie 
Mr. Leroy. Mr. Leroy is the Senior Vice President and General Counsel of the World Bank Group, uh, a position to which she was appointed in 2009. She was, in fact, returning to the bank where she'd been a senior uh, public sector specialist in the 1990s, working on public management issues in North Africa. Uh, Ms. Leroy came back to the World Bank from private practice uh, with the Paris office of Denton, Wild and Sap. Uh, before entering private practice, she'd served as a senior advisor uh, to Prime Minister Jospin and as a judge at the French Conseil d'Etat. Ms. Leroy, we're grateful for your agreeing to be with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, um, Secretary General. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for inviting me to join you today to celebrate the 120th uh, anniversary of the Hague Conference on Private International Law. The organization's long history and its broad membership and the important multilateral legal instruments on private international law that it has developed are proof of the significant role that the Hague Conference has played in contributing to increased legal certainty in matters involving multiple jurisdictions. The World Bank is a very different organization with a very different mandate. And yet, uh, I do believe that there are uh, areas where we can help each other, and I will, uh, I will go to that um, later on. The World Bank is a development uh, an economic development organization. This is our mandate. Our overarching mission is to eradicate poverty through economic growth. Uh, it's a very large organization now we have, uh, and our membership is uh, almost universal. Um, and it's a very large organization of almost 15,000 people. Uh, I will get back to that because reaching out to the World Bank for the Hague Conference is not necessarily easy. Um, but uh, still, uh, because we promote economic growth for decades now, the World Bank has promoted and continues to promote law as an important dimension, dimension of sustainable and equitable economic growth, including in connection with the facilitation of commerce across borders. Uh, let me quote here because I cannot make any speech uh, without quoting my predecessor, Ibrahim Shihata. Uh, former general counsel of the World Bank who said once, the rule of law creates certainty and predictability. It leads to lower transaction costs, greater access to capital, and the establishment of level playing fields. Private international law in particular contributes to the removal of legal obstacles and the creation of cross-border private law relations and transactions. Private international law balances international consensus with domestic recognition, and also balances in, in, uh, the actions of sovereigns and of private actors. Private international law principles and rules help to improve commercial certainty by providing clear channels to increase investment and facilitate the development of international trade. As you know, the World Bank has given considerable attention to strengthening the legal enabling environment, both within nations and internationally, to facilitate the growth of equitable and inclusive private sector uh, led, and, and to facilitate the flow of goods, services, and capital across borders. Private international law is a helpful means to that end. For example, studies conducted by the bank have noted the positive effect of the Apostille Convention on the ability of foreign investors to start businesses in those countries that are parties to it. The convention has greatly simplified the authentication of public documents to be used abroad by dispensing with a cumbersome legalization process and replacing it with a single authentication certificate from an authority in the state where the document was executed. Through its numerous conventions, the Hague Conference is creating, in fact, public goods that provide uniform solutions to complex problems faced by many countries, despite their differences in legal systems. Its influence cannot be measured solely by the number of states that have formally adopted these conventions, 
Many countries also often use these conventions as models, borrowing all or some of the rules therein and incorporating them into their domestic laws. In recent years, our member countries have seen the critical role of the World Bank as residing not only in its provision of long-term financing for development, but in the knowledge and know-how that the bank is able to help convene and harness to enhance development efforts. We aspire to be a solutions bank for development, and a critical part of that depends on the power of shared knowledge. With its global reach, the bank is ideally positioned to connect and convene stakeholders from around the world in order to facilitate knowledge exchange across international boundaries. In today's world, knowledge does not fly, does not only, sorry, flow from north to south, but the reverse is also true as are south-south exchanges. President Kim recently noted that knowledge now flows, I'm quoting here, from entrepreneurs in Delhi to citizens in rural Mexico to civil society in Lagos to policy makers in Sarajevo. The, the legal vice presidency in this vein has launched a couple of years ago the Global Forum on Law, Justice and Development, which facilitates the knowledge exchange goal. The Global Forum is pioneering a transformative agenda for a global discourse that includes law, justice, and equity in the new paradigm of economic development that is both sustainable and equitable. The Global Forum offers the potential to harness an enormous coalition of intellectual partners across continents and disciplines into a platform for knowledge sharing and dissemination for the purpose of aiding policymakers in improving development outcomes. To date, 126 partners from international organizations, international financial institutions, civil society organizations, the judiciary, central banks, and foundations have joined the Global Forum. The Hague Conference itself has joined this initiative a year ago, uh, 13 months ago actually, and the bank welcomes the inclusion of more partners to utilize this platform to the fullest extent. Uh, last year, for instance, the Hague Conference participated in the Law, Justice and Development Week 2012, where the Global Forum was launched officially, and specifically the conference part participated in the session on how to work together, international organizations, and the development of the law of secure transactions. In that session, representatives from the Hague Conference, Citroën and Unidroit, discussed the work of their organizations, their text on secure transactions, and approaches to integrate the work of their organizations into the development dialogue. At the core of the Global Forum are its thematic working groups, which cover several areas. There are working groups dealing with justice and rule of law, law and the economy, environmental and natural resources law, governance and anti-corruption, and empowerment and equity for diverse communities. The working groups are divided into subgroups that are led by intellectual partners who are accountable for managing each subgroup and for its uh, knowledge outputs. The forum can provide the Hague Conference an opportunity to make an invaluable intellectual contribution by participating in these working groups and taking the lead on private international law issues. In fact, the uh, forum can be a, a way for the uh, Hague Conference to make it to, to increase the awareness of its conventions as well as to exchange on the content of the convention and on further cooperation with other organizations that are part of the forum. And uh, it is also possible uh, for the Hague Convention as well as for other partners to promote the creation of new working groups or new subgroups uh, that are of specific interest to the activities of the Hague Convention in Citroën and UNIDRA. And uh, that, that is an area where uh, we can work together very much as several participants have already said, uh, it is necessary now for uh, the Hague Conference to uh, further increase awareness, especially in the continents where um, it's, uh, this awareness is still uh, lagging, namely Africa and Southeast Asia. These are all uh, client countries of the World Bank. 
And so beyond even the global forum, I would encourage the Hague Conference to continue to reach out to the bank and the legal department is certainly committed to uh, helping uh, you to do this. As I said, it's a very complex matrix organization of almost 15,000 people. Not all people working on legal development and helping countries uh, develop their private sector uh, law are with the legal department, far from that actually. In the matrix organizations, there are at least two other networks where you can find people working on legal development. Uh, the finance and private sector development network primarily, but also the poverty reduction and economic management network. And I could also mention the, advi the advisory services of our sister organization, the International Finance Corporation. Um, we know all of them, but uh, we, uh, it, it's hard actually, and it, it takes work uh, to reach all of them. But if you increase awareness of these people, on the uh, power of the conventions to help private sector development, to help attract foreign investors to uh, our client countries, they will in turn uh, be your best advocates uh, in those uh, client countries. And uh, uh, the legal department of the World Bank is clearly uh, ready and, and committed to helping you do that uh, if you wish so. so uh, uh, with this, let me congratulate you again on this uh, 120th anniversary and wish you all the be best for the future. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to thank each of our speakers. It's not easy to say as much as they have each said in 10 minutes, and they've been terrific in staying to that uh, limitation. I, I've been busily scribbling away in an effort to try to bring what we've had said this morning, this afternoon together in a way that would allow a discussion. It seems to me you could take all of what's been said in different ways, but I might put it under three different headings, uh, the problems that have been described and the opportunities that have been described. Uh, one broad heading would be adherence, uh, just joining the conventions of the different groups that have been uh, described here today. The second heading I would call implementation or system strengthening, which goes to techniques uh, for effective compliance. And we can all think of things that have been said that fall into that category. And the third one would be new subjects uh, for initiatives, uh, some of which might be substantive uh, documents, uh, some of which might be uh, the kind of uh, perception of the utility of what already exists in various quarters. Having tried to sort of categorize all we've said and, and, and the differences that we have, uh, do any of the speakers listening to the others have any thoughts that they might advance, or should we ask the audience to uh, tell us what we have not covered? Ask the audience. All right. Um, questions uh, from the audience on what we might clarify uh, in what has been said. Don't all raise your hands at once. Okay. Um, you know this famous press conference that President de Gaulle had where the press had all agreed not to ask a question and um, it, it, during Algeria. And, and towards the end of the conference, the question hadn't come up and they weren't going to ask it. And so he leaned forward and said, you me semble quelqu'un m'a posé une question. And he then responded, <laughs> to the question that he wanted asked, even if they weren't going to ask it. Uh, so I will ask you each to finish up, because we are on a tight time schedule as well. Uh, we are having heard all that you've heard today. Um, you think the conference can make its greatest contribution. Uh, put, put another way, um, is it in new programs? Is it in awareness of effectiveness? Is it in the use of techniques, electronic and otherwise. In other words, if you were tomorrow morning going to start working with some element of the conference, where would you start? And I think that might be a good way to kind of wrap up our discussion because we are running close to five and I know uh, I don't want to take away from the interview, but what would you like to do Monday morning as opposed to over the next five or ten years, which many of you have, have, have described? Um, let me see who wants to start on that one. 
Rufus, you're smiling. Maybe you're willing to do it. Well, I don't, I don't really know where to start. I, I mean, uh, you know, I think one thing that all of us sense is how much th the world is changing and how rapidly it's changing in terms of uh, not just uh, the problems we face, but also the kinds of governance structures that, that we have to deal with. I mean, in many ways, um, it's an exciting time uh, that clearly is um, seeing uh, a rise to prominence of more and more uh, groups, uh, nations that have sort of been underrepresented in the nation state system. Uh, you know, the, the end of the, the, the sort of bipolar world we lived in for a long time uh, has brought about a, a tremendous uh, change, both in terms of economic activity, but also in terms of um, differing perspectives on, um, on what kind of governance structures to adopt and what kind of, of what does the rule of law mean. Uh, and I think this is really obviously an area that I think needs to be focused on by all uh, institutions. I know that mine has gone through a, a fundamental transformation. I, I worked in, an, in a negotiation where really the, the U.S. and the European uh, influence was so great that uh, others had no choice but to sort of yeah. eventually re reconcile themselves yeah. to that kind of, of, of leadership. Now. Uh, it's very much more a shared model. So I, it, it seems to me, I hope I'm not being too uh, scattered in my thinking here, but no, one good. of the things to focus on is how uh, in that evolving environment, how does that change the work of all of our organizations and how can we respond most effectively to a much more um, shared model of not just governance but of what kinds of principles then contribute to the rule of law? Okay, thank you. I'm gonna go down the panel, starting as I did with you. I, I might also say that the organization that did the Aposti Convention, the Legalization Convention, might well have something to contribute to the reduction of documentation that you described as being a 10% saving for each of us on our products. I, I like that idea. Uh, ben? Thank you very much. The question is Monday morning. I don't want to approach it in a very light note saying I will start fundraising. Uh, but I've already said that quite a number of the issues are not necessarily about financial resources. Uh, so the, the, the point that I want to make is that Monday morning maybe to drill the point that a Hague conference on private international law without Africa, in fact without the majority of African countries uh, on board, uh, might not necessarily be uh, an ideal Hague conference, a world organization uh, that is working on cross-border uh, cooperation. I've already made the point that uh, Africa is the new frontier, not only in terms of inter-country adoption, uh, but also a number of other issues uh, related to the other three uh, Hague conventions. So identifying Africa uh, as one of the main priorities uh, as we move forward uh, might be the point that I want to uh, propose uh, on Monday morning. Thank you. Thank you. I must say your point about regionalization sharing seemed to me to be one that could be equally applicable in Latin America or other parts of the world. And the, the idea that sharing is not just global, that there is something in talking to people who know each other and are close to each other is a very good one. And I, I, I'm glad you made that. Anne-Marie? Uh, I, I would agree with uh, Mr. Mesmer. Um, I think you on, on Monday morning, I would focus on the countries that are presently growing very rapidly. Uh, and there are several of them in Africa that, I mean, the press has, um, um, there, there have been several uh, publications recently about uh, countries that are rising very, very rapidly now in international trade and very rapid growth. I'm mentioning Kenya, Nigeria, um, Rwanda, Kenya, uh, Ghana, a uh, couple of others. Uh, I would focus on these, maybe using the example of South Africa. I understand South Africa is a member uh, of the Hague uh, uh, Conference. And, uh, but of course, uh, Southeast Asia is also important, but I would focus on Africa because, because this is definitely, uh, when you look at the map of the member countries, that huge continent is, is, is very, very uh, missing. 
Um, now, you asked, I think, a question about what means to use electronic, etc. I, unfortunately, I don't think that anything at present replaces uh, personal contact uh, training um, in the countries, uh, especially because we're uh, talking here of countries that often don't have 24-hour uh, power uh, coverage. Uh, where internet is either absent or very slow. Um, so uh, if you count on the internet to reach out to those countries, the, uh, your progress may be actually very slow. So I would, uh, I would still uh, think of organizing regional uh, conferences of traveling and meeting them. Uh, one reason why our 15,000 people are so hard to reach is that they're, they're constantly traveling. And the reason why they're traveling is that you can't still, you still can't work uh, efficiently from a distance. You need to meet people. Yeah. There's a place for the hardcover book still. <laughs> uh, Susan Bissom? In terms, of, in terms, sorry, in terms of financial capacity, it does have an impact. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and in fact, uh, the Hague Academy, which meets in this building, has continued to publish in hardcover for the very reasons that you articulate about the the electronic resources. Uh, Susan? I have something for Monday, something for Wednesday, and something for Friday. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's sort of a happy coincidence that when you ask the question about Monday, um, that somebody from The Hague should be on a plane and traveling to Bangkok for the first ever uh, global summit with WHO and UNICEF on civil registration and birth registration. So my point really being, uh, the Hague becoming a strong advocate for, for civil registration and in particular birth registration as it relates to um, the relevant uh, conventions and child mm. protection. So for Wednesday, um, I think that there's no area of the provision of technical assistance or capacity building where we've seen such efficacy in the field, and I, I say that from a UNICEF perspective. So, so greater provision of technical assistance in countries where either they're they are signatories or are planning to be signatories, um, again, in my own field relevant to child protection. And the third thing for Friday, uh, and we've already started talking about it this morning, is, is deepening, um, uh, you're helping us deepen our understanding and our ability to grapple with the 1996 convention. I think if we're to look at, at trends and where we ought to be positioning ourselves, um, it, it's there, and I think that the expertise uh, lies here. So I think we have a busy, week next week okay. and uh, months ahead of us. Thank That's you. good. And uh, Angela? Uh, thank you. Um, I also divided my thoughts into three topics, not necessarily Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Probably everything can be done, should still be start on, on Monday and probably stay stuck on there on the Friday of the 12 months or 12 year after that. But there are three layers, I think, of concern and activity. But I think that something more can and should be done, not necessarily only by the Hague Conference, and actually the Hague Conference itself would not achieve the improvement of the current situation by itself. In one level, I would call consolidating and systematizing, and here I mean instruments that are out there. I doubt that anyone in this room can tell me how many private law instruments exist in the world produced by the Hague Conference, UNCITRAL, uh, UNIDRA, the European Union, and then you name it. I don't think that anyone really knows all of them. To how much overlap exists there and how much loopholes exist between them. Uh, and why is it that some are a success? Why is it that others are less of a success? And I think there is an immense work to be done there in terms of making the international community and legal practitioners understand what is out there, making governments understand what they have already done, and why is it that uh, work done here was more successful than work done there. And this also has, a not, has another dimension, and that relates to what you're just saying. You gave an example of one layer of concern, and that is the protection of the child, and then you realize, but there is a private law aspect here. Now, how many other instruments around there in the world have that kind of implication and are just waiting for someone to realize it 
and then as invite those organizations to bring their expertise to the table to help the our organizations fulfill their mandate. Just give one example. We are now at Unidra in Rome cooperating with FAO on private law aspects of agricultural in investment as a, a supplement to their work on food security. Hmm. Second topic, coordination rationalization in between institutions. It has a little bit to do with what I mentioned before, but goes a little bit beyond that. The international community of international organizations consists of uh, a plethora of entities that have a varying number of shareholders, but eventually the shareholders are all the same. And we're all in the business of spending taxpayers' money. Uh, some organizations are better endowed than other organizations that have uh, uh, less resources. But none of this is coordinated in a rational fashion. And I think the day should come for organizations to discuss their work programs together and issue some sort of a better uh, way of spending money and avoiding duplication, but also in complementing each other. How many international conventions will cover one particular topic and then have one provision on private international law? And then we draft another convention on, on another contract and we add another provision of private international law. And so you multiply and duplicate uh, instruments. And the last point is cooperation and, as, and assistance. And here I mean individual states and also individuals. Uh, the Hague Conference has been pioneer on that. And I think it, it's a path that should proceed and is one that uh, the only way of really ensuring that the investment made in producing international instrument bears fruit, and that is uh, providing technical assistance and going out, reaching out in the world for the promotion of, of tax. And there, I think, again, uh, there's a lot that uh, needs still, still to be done to show to the world in a combined way what we have done. Uh, Ms. Lagoa mentioned the session on the, during the Law Justice Development Week last year when the three organizations, the Conference on Central and, and UNIDRA, uh, presented together their work on uh, secure transactions. We have produced a joint publication. Now, there are m much more that we have done so far that where the links between the various instruments are not yet c sufficiently clear, and we should do more into explaining that. Thank you. Thank you. And thank if you'll join me in thanking the panel for a both constructive, informative, and very interesting discussion. Thank you for coming all this way and for celebrating the conference.